There are people who say they like Buddhism because it doesn't tell them what they should do, which is very ironic, because the Buddha thought that was the most important thing he left behind, a basis for deciding what you should and shouldn't do. That, he said, was one of the main duties of a teacher. Of course, he didn't impose the shoulds on you. But as he pointed out, if you wanted to put an end to suffering, this is what you should do. There are teachers in his day who said that everything you experience is based on past actions, or everything is based on the act of some creator god, or it's totally random. And the Buddha would actually argue with those people. He said, if you teach that, you're basically saying that when people kill or steal or have illicit sex or lie or take intoxicants in the present moment, it's because of something they did in the past, or because of a creator god, or because of random, spontaneous events. And when you teach people that, you don't give them any basis for deciding what should and shouldn't be done. Everything is just determined one way or another. Their present actions, their present choices have no role in what they do. That he said, you're leaving them unprotected. You're not fulfilling a teacher's duty. Because as he saw, our actions are our most important possession. That chant we had just now, we subject to aging, illness, death, separation from all that we find dear and appealing. This body we have is going to leave us, and before it leaves us, it's, it's going to start falling apart. Our relationships with other people are going to end. What do we have left to depend on? Our actions. So when our actions are so important, of course they're going to be shoulds. What will be the best thing to do? And you look deeply into the mind, and you find that it's very active. It's not simply reacting to things outside. The mind is proactive. It's looking for happiness. One of our most basic questions comes from the experience of pain. On the one hand, we're bewildered by it because pain, whether it's mental pain or physical pain, can come in so many different ways. It comes so unexpectedly. And you think you've figured out one cause for pain, here comes another one. Which may be very different. So we search. Who knows a way or two to put an end to this pain? So we're already looking. We ask other people, we look around on our own. And the Buddha is offering his teachings as an answer to that question. There are ways that we can act that will help get us beyond suffering. And he lays out the path. There's a right path and there's a wrong path. And one of the main factors of the right path is right mindfulness. And the function of right mindfulness is to remember what the Buddha said about what should be done. That's what should be done. He laid that out in it, the first factor of the path, which is right view. Wherever there's pain, suffering, stress, you should try to comprehend it. That's not normally our first reaction. Our first reaction is to try to run away from it or to push it away. It's like one of those toys where you push it away and the more strongly you try to push it away, the more strongly it comes back. So no, you should try to comprehend it. You comprehend it by seeing that the suffering itself is something you might not expect. The Buddha gives examples. Aging, illness and death are suffering. Not getting what you want is suffering having to be with what you don't like, having to be separated from what you do like. These things are all suffering. We're familiar with all these. 
But then he says the common denominator of all those things is something unexpected, clinging to the five aggregates. And the aggregates here are activities of the mind. There's the body, and even the body, he says, is an activity. Form, he says, deforms. Feelings, perceptions, thought fabrications, acts of consciousness, all of these are activities that we do. And because we try to feed off these things, that's what the clinging is. We suffer. But the suffering is in the clinging. Why do we cling? Because of craving. We either crave sensual pleasures, crave just the fact of fantasizing about sensual pleasures, or we crave what the Buddha calls becoming, which is taking on an identity and a world of experience. It can either be a world in the mind or the world outside. And there's craving for non-becoming. In other words, you find yourself in a world or an identity that you really don't like. You'd like to see it destroyed. That's something that should be abandoned. And then there's a third noble truth, which is the fact that suffering can be ended by abandoning the craving. In other words, you attack it at the cause, not at the suffering itself. So many of us try to let go of the suffering when we should actually be letting go of the craving. And the way you do that is through the fourth noble truth, which is the Noble Eightfold Path. Right view, right resolve, and all the way through right mindfulness and right concentration. This is something that should be developed. So these are things you keep in mind. There are some shoulds here. You should comprehend suffering. You should abandon its cause. You should realize the cessation by developing the path. Those are things you've got to keep in mind, because the mind is constantly looking around, and it's looking around trying to decide what to do. A lot of it's talking to itself is basically, what am I going to do next? What am I going to do next? What should I do next? What's worth doing next? And the Buddha puts those two questions together, what should be done and what's worth doing. That's basically the same question. In other words, you don't have to worry about some outside authority who's giving the orders. We've got the Buddha's recommendations. If you want to put in into suffering, that's a worthwhile thing. Then you should do what is worth doing. For instance, with the path. Like we're sitting here right now. This is the path that we're on right now. Focusing on the body. Just the body in and of itself, as it breathes in, as it breathes out. Ardent, alert, mindful. Putting aside greed and distress with reference to the world. So we keep this frame of reference in mind, so they don't get entangled in the greed and distress that come with the states of becoming. That we can either think up right now, or we think about the world outside. When you think about those things, then the shoulds may begin to change. But when you stay simply with the body in and of itself, you can remind yourself, this is what I should be doing. I should try to get the mind to settle down, be right here. So when you're talking to yourself, this is what you do. You talk to yourself about, this is what I should be doing. And you try to remind yourself. Each time the mind slips off, you remind yourself, come on back. And try to breathe in a way that feels good. The Buddha talks about this. Breathing in a way that gives rise to a sense of fullness, refreshment. Breathing in a way that gives rise to a sense of ease. And when you have that sense of fullness and refreshment and a sense of ease, you allow it to spread around the body. Think of it going down the nerves, going down the blood vessels, out to every pore. If there are any patterns of tension, you think of them dissolving away as this easeful breath energy comes through the body. And in the beginning, you have to talk to yourself about this, to remind yourself where you are and what you're doing. Because it's all too easy when the breath gets very comfortable to zone out. So you give it work to do. You remind yourself, okay, 
You can't just wallow in the ease. You let it spread so it saturates the body. It may sound like you're just giving yourself a bigger pillow to wallow in. But as you're mindful of the whole body, it strengthens your alertness, it strengthens your awareness. And then the conversation can go more into the background. This inner chatter where you're telling yourself what to do. In fact, it gets down to simply remind yourself to breath, 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 or whole body, whole body. The message become a lot simpler. It's like that passage in Sirens of Titan, where they go to the planet Mercury. And in Kurt Vonnegut's vision of the planet Mercury, it's one large honeycomb crystal. One side is facing the sun, it's hot, and the other side is very cold. And so it gets the crystal vibrating. And there are animals called little harmoniums. They look like little kites with suction cups on the corners. And they don't have to feed off of one another. All they have to do is feed off the vibrations. You can imagine what that's like. Infinite source of food. No struggle, no fighting, no killing. You can just live off the vibrations. Extremely pleasant environment. There's less and less to talk about. And so they basically have two messages that they send telepathically to one another. One is, here I am, here I am, here I am. The other is, so glad you are, so glad you are, so glad you are. When you can provide the mind with a sense of well-being like this that permeates the body, the messages get a lot simpler. They're not as interesting. But they're very satisfying. And you ask yourself, why do I have to be interesting? You'll have something to get interested in soon, but first get the mind to settle down and have this sense of ease. Allow it to saturate the body. Because then the question will come up, is this as good as it gets? And the answer is no, it's better. But for better, you have to understand the suffering even more. There's even, even in this concentration, when the mind settles in like this, and there's a sense of ease and well-being, there's still some stress. It's very subtle, but it comes and it goes, because it's all fabricated. You have to keep putting it together. And so you have to start asking questions about these fabrications. Here again, you're talking to yourself, but you're asking questions, and you're asking questions in line with the vulnerable truths and their duties again. Where is the clinging here? Can you see it come and go? Then what's the craving? Can you see that come and go? So you have to get the one very, very still. And you find that better than rapture and refreshment and ease is simply a state of equanimity. The mind settles in in a more and more subtle level. You know, the body feels still, the mind feels still, which means that any movements in the mind are going to become a lot clearer. Then you ask yourself, okay, what's sparking those movements? So again, there are some questions you ask yourself. And there are questions you should ask. It all depends on how you frame the questions. Again, in terms of the Four Noble Truths, where is the stress? What is the cause? What can be done to let go of that? Because some causes are suffering. All you have to do is look at them and you see, I do this and there's going to be suffering. It's very easy to see. You ask yourself, why, why on earth would I do that? And you drop it. Others are more difficult because they're things you like. And you have to convince yourself that it's not worth it. This is where the Buddha asks you to look at things in terms of 
how this stress arises, how it, what's causing it, how it passes away. What's the allure? What is this about what you're doing that you like doing? And then you look for the drawbacks. And when you see that the drawbacks outweigh the allure, that's when you let go. So there's an inner conversation about what's worth doing at all the different stages of the practice. In some cases it's more blatant. So it starts from the very beginning. And the Buddha recommends generosity, recommends virtue. These are things that you choose to do because they're worth doing. It's a value judgment. Then you get the mind into meditation. Even a simple practice like goodwill, it's a mindfulness practice. You kind of keep reminding yourself. Goodwill for all beings. It doesn't come naturally. You focus on the breath. You have to remind yourself to stay with the breath. In some cases you have to actively talk to yourself, especially if the mind finds it hard to settle down. You have to ask yourself why. Try to figure it out. And there will be an inner conversation. And when you figure out the problems, okay, then you can settle in more clearly, more fully. And the conversation gets less and less until you begin to notice okay, okay, the concentration itself can take you only so far. And then you look around to see where the clinging still is, where you're clinging to the con concentration. But you don't want to go back to cling to the things that you left as you got the mind into concentration. So the question is, where is the alternative? So the questions you ask, you're trying to find answers. It starts with a very basic question. Who knows a way to put an end to suffering? And you follow through. There's a should do and a shouldn't do, and you've got to remind yourself which is which, which is why you talk to yourself. And then when the answer comes, when the reality of the answer comes, that there's something in the mind, deathless. Okay, that's the point where you totally let go of all the conversation. But even after you've had that experience, you have to ask yourself, well, what now? You want to make sure that you've taken care of all the different causes of suffering. And you'll find out that there are stages in awakening. So again, there are things you have to remind yourself to do and not to do. Things that are worth doing, things that are not worth doing. There's a value judgment that keeps on taking you to the end. So that's the nature of the Buddha's shoulds. He's offering them to you as recommendations. He's not imposing them on you. But he says, if you follow these instructions and use your ingenuity as you follow them, it's not simply a matter of following orders, following the rules. It requires your own sensitivity and your own discernment. But you find that it answers that question. It is possible to put an end to suffering, and not just individual pains, but all the suffering the mind creates for itself. So when the Buddha offers these shoulds, it's really a gift. It's not an imposition. And we do well, too. Keep these things in mind so that we can act on them. Until we arrive at what the Buddha says, the path is a path of action that puts an end to action. Because the deathless is something you don't do. 
There's no doing in it at all. And that's where you can put those shoulds down. As the Buddha said, when someone has gained total awakening, he has nothing more to teach that person. And that person's path can't be traced. He says it's like the footprints of birds in the air as they fly past. They don't leave any footprints. They can't be traced. And John Lee makes a comparison. He says, well, we're following the Buddha's path it's as if we're his servants. But the Buddha has provided a way for us to get ourselves out of slavery and divine real freedom. That's the best gift of all. <laughs>